What do CEOs need to know about sales these days? A lot. Outdated sales strategies and tactics plague most companies today. Listen to what innovative CEOs and experts have to say about how to change all that with Sales Talk for CEOs. Imagine if you could get all the R&D money you needed from the government. As a CEO, that would be amazing. But I bet that most of you don't even know that money's available or where to begin. And that is why I'm so excited to have this special guest on today because he and his co-founder created a company called Boast to help you do just that. I'm excited to have Lloyd Lobo today. He started as an engineer turned sales guy, which disappointed his parents greatly. However, because of that, he's ended up working in startups his entire career and recently wrote a book about it that will be so helpful to all of you. We'll talk about that more at the end, but it's called From Grassroots to Greatness. Welcome, Lloyd. Alice, I'm such a huge fan. I'm having a fanboy <laughs> moment. In when I got into sales, my first job was in sales, and I spent hours every day on my drives to different locations from like New Jersey to upstate New York and Philly, listening to books like New Strategic Selling, Conceptual Selling, Large Account Management, because we were we were we were selling to very very large companies so it's like oh was, i'm having this fanboy uh, fanboy moment here right now oh my gosh well thank you for being a miller hyman fan those um methodologies that my dad and his partner bob put in those books and and trained people on for many many years and you know still going strong with corn fairy as the owner they still work today why because they are all completely customer focused, as you know, right? And that is really what it's all about. And you are one of those people who I love to hear about because you are so customer focused as well. And in fact, you are an expert in building communities and we are going to get to that. So um, I want to hear just a little bit more about what Boast does. Tell all the CEOs because I'm sure they're going to want to flock to the site and figure this out. But so tell us about that. Definitely. So globally, hundreds of millions, hundreds of billions of dollars are given in funding by governments to businesses that develop new technology or improve existing technology. This could be a manufacturing company or an innovative tech startup. But as long as you're developing something new or improving an existing product, material process or technology, you could access this money like the U.S. government. You could get half a million dollars a year in cash or more if you're offsetting income taxes. And in Canada, for example, you could get 64% of your product development spend as a cash back. The problem is with anything government, it's a cumbersome application process. It's prone to frustrating audits and receiving the money takes a long time. So Boast integrates with your technical systems and your financial systems to figure out what you qualify for. We automatically apply for it and make sure you get the money from the government. And if there's an audit, we deal with it. And recently, we started one more thing. We announced a $100 million fund because the government takes a long time to give you that money. So we said, why wait for the government to pay you? Plug your tech and financial stack to Boast. For every month or quarter, you qualify in R&D. We know that's going to get you the money from the government. We'll give you the money now so you don't wait to get it from the government. So that's, that's an add-on service. And now, because we have access to all this data, your your technical data, your financial data, and your banking data, we can stitch your R&D to financial outcomes. And so soon we're launching R&D analytics, which is who you should hire, what projects you should invest in, so you can accelerate your innovation. Because what's happened is, if you see in the last 15, 20 years, more than 50% of the Fortune 500 companies have evaporated because they don't innovate fast enough. And 99% of the innovations die on the vine because they don't know the best methodologies to innovate. So just getting you money for your innovation, your R&D, your product development is not enough. We found our customers' journey is helping them accelerate innovation. So that's where we're going, starting with getting you the money, getting you the money faster, and now then helping you spend that money wisely. This is so unique. I haven't really heard of anyone that offers all of those services. I haven't really even heard of anyone that's helping 
uh, to find that R and D money. So I, I am just amazed by this and I love it, but tell me, how did you and your co-founder get the idea to do this way back when, about 10 years ago, when you started, what were you doing right before you started and how did you get this idea? Definitely. So my, uh, uh, me and Alex, we went to university together. We were best friends. We were partners in every project. He was the guy that built stuff. And I was the guy that sold the idea. Even our undergrad thesis was on collision avoidance on real-time vehicles in 2004 or five. And I was the person pitching it. Alex was the person building it. So we had built this great camaraderie. Now, after engineering, he gets into Johnson & Johnson's engineering leadership program. Very rare, like two per country. And after working there a couple of years, he goes and does a startup and that startup doesn't work out. And he felt he missed, you know, the accounting finance skills. So, so he goes and studied accounting and finance and his unique combo of engineering and accounting takes him into this world of R&D credits, which is predominantly done by big four accounting firms. And my journey after I finished engineering I didn't want to go and work somewhere. So I asked a few business people like, hey, what's the best skill I could learn if I wanted to be a successful entrepreneur or business person someday? And they told me your, your communication is weak and being a business person is all about communication from convincing your spouse that you're never going to bring money for a long time <laughs> to 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 convincing customers that you have nothing, please buy it, or convincing early employees that I don't have money to pay you, but join this vision. And even as you scale, right, like you have to keep communicating to evangelize your employees to buy into that vision, investors, the media, it's all communication. Now, I, I recognize that I needed to improve it, but I also knew that self-motivation was hard for me as it is for 99% of the people. Self-motivation is not showing up when things are perfect. Self-motivation is do you show up when you're repeatedly punched in the face? And so for me, it was, hey, I could have gone and done a public speaking class, but if I went on stage and 10 people made fun of me, I would have probably been deterred and never gone on again. So I started applying to sales jobs because I'm like, what better way? If I suck at something, the best way to learn that something is to put myself in an environment that forces me to do it day in, day out. It's a system now. It's not motivation. And so I started applying to sales jobs, big companies like Xerox, you know, back in the day, everyone would want to go work at Xerox to get yeah. the best sales training. And they turned me down. So many companies that had the best sales training, like IBM, Xerox, they turned me down because people were also weirded out that why does this person who graduated engineering want to go into sales? Does he suck as an engineer? And so luck would have it that, um, and I say luck a lot, and I'll tell you why near the end, but Luck would have it, I get an interview with a founder at a telecom company, small team, to do cold calling. And I jumped at the opportunity. First job, I first call, I practice four hours. The decision maker Pause. shows up. He jumped on the opportunity to do cold calling, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Just kind of tells you a little bit about Lloyd right now. <laughs> I Because, like, imagine... I had probably like 20, 25 interviews. I read every sales book I could to practice for the interview and reading was very hard for me. So listening to audiobooks, and I couldn't get a break. And then I get this opportunity to interview for a cold calling job with a startup with, with a, and startups weren't huge, like 2004, five, like outside of Silicon Valley, you know, they were seen as small, obscure companies. Why would you want to join them kind of thing? But nonetheless, I took this job. And I practice four hours to make this cold call. The decision maker shows up. Everyone's watching me and I hang up and everyone's laughing. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, I practice, 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 get better. And then my, my wife now, girlfriend then, gets into med school in New Jersey. And I start applying to jobs in New Jersey. And because my first job was with a founder, no other big company would hire me. So I got another job with a small company and... I joined there doing sales. I was excited. Wow. Graduated from cold calling to sales. Go there. Of course, no repeatable, scalable process or product. So it's drive to different locations all over upstate New York. Talk to big customers like Tiffany, Armani, Simon & Schuster. Figure out what to sell. They had high-paid salespeople who were closers. So, But I was like had to go and help them figure it out given I had the engineering background. But then now translate it into wireframes and requirements for the development team. And then, oh, by the way, build a marketing website. And most kids, I think, today would quit. I didn't have the opportunity to quit. I was in the, I, I was 
my first job was in Canada. I had studied when I university in Canada. And so the next job, if I wanted to be with her, I had to not quit because I was on a TN visa. I couldn't quit. So I, I did it. I did it, did it, got really better at it. And the next job was VP sales and marketing at another startup. Because when you're at small companies or startups in the early days, especially when there's no product market fit, you're creating the playbook that becomes hugely valuable. You're creating the processes. You're learning a lot more. It's like working in dog years. So I, my progression was quick, then went on to be VP sales and marketing at the next company. And then one day Alex calls me and he said, I want to do this startup automating R&D tax credits. It's so manual. It's broken. I jumped at the opportunity. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. So what, what made him know that that was broken? How did he get that idea? Do you know? Yeah, because he was doing that for the big four accounting firm. And oh, he's like, dude, yeah, I see. So he's like, it's all manual. Like we go there and we, at the end of the tax year, we'll go to a company CTO and say, tell me what you did in R&D that meets this criteria. And you do long multi-hour interviews with different engineers in a company. And, you know, the some companies like the tech companies are moderately documented, but like manufacturing and construction, they're not. And so you're like sitting and doing these long interviews and he's like, it's dreadful, man. There has to be a better way. And that's how it starts, right? There has to be a better way. Why has it been done this way where you're, you're spending so many labor human hours to put this together yeah. when, when there should be a tech enabled way to do it. So that's how we started. So you didn't necessarily have any any passion around that particular topic, but you had a lot of uh, time with Alex and you knew you two could work well together and you knew you had the skills that he needed to take that to market. So let's start there and talk about how did you do it? How did you do the first sales? And, uh, you know, how did you start building your community and why? And then uh, talk about when you decided to start hiring some salespeople and how it grew from there. Definitely. So Alice, you know, one thing I'll tell because I want the audience to not uh, feel that, you know, we knew all the frameworks going right in. Now, over like, say, six years of doing cold calling to selling on the field on the phone, I had developed this muscle, right? And, and so that is my natural inclination is cold call, pick up the phone, dial for dollars, meet people in person. But when we were in it, honestly, we didn't realize how hard it would be. It all felt like throwing spaghetti on the wall. Now you can look back and see it as being a framework. So when we started the company, we started cold calling. And we said, well, let's call the most stable companies. Manufacturing, construction, oil and gas, top companies. This is 2012. Nobody would take our call. It was impossible. Because imagine, it sounds so scammy, right? Give me your technical R&D data and I'll get you money from the government. No equity, right. no interest. Yeah, they're like just deleting your messages all over the place, right? They're like hanging up, deleting. Or if they know about it, they're like, I haven't even heard of you people. And from LinkedIn, it looks like you guys just came out of school a few years ago. Why would I not work with a big four accounting firm? So that was hard. So we're like, okay, you know what? let's go and start attending some of these events. So we started going to construction, oil and gas manufacturing events, and we just couldn't relate. We just didn't fit in. We looked like two guys who threw on a suit jacket on top of their hoodies, and they felt like the cigars club. Like, it just wouldn't connect. So dejected now, we end up flocking the startup events, the tech events, and instant connection. We felt like we found our friends. They were people just starting out. We were just starting out those initial event attendances turned into dinners, turned into partying with them, hanging out with them. Basically, we were eating, breathing, and sleeping in the same place as they were. We could connect with them really well. We understood their circle of influence. We participated in hackathons together, and, and we built this great camaraderie with them. And you know, now that I look back, I'll give you a framework that I, that I found useful for early entrepreneurs. You're starting, you don't know who to target. Number one, do you have a passion for this audience? If you don't love your customers, you can't sustainably create or build anything. Building a company, let alone a community-led company, is a long haul, right? It's a long slog, marathon of the hot and mind. If you hate your customers, you can't create. The second thing is, it, is it a growing niche? I mean, startups are small, but the one thing is it was growing and it exploded. The third thing is, do they have a propensity to pay? Now, 
for us, we were getting them money and we would take the money percentage when we get it from the government. And the last one is ease of access. You can have the passion for this market and it can be massive, but if there's no ease of access, like with oil and gas and construction and manufacturing, nobody would talk to us, you're finished. So for us, those four things, and I, I think as you think about it, more and more entrepreneurs, hey, do I have the passion for them? Can I keep creating for them? Is there an ease of access? And is it a market that will grow? I think those are keys. And then, and so we found two white spaces there because it was a small niche. One was nobody would give them any love and support. And, and so a lot of our competitors would be like, chasing the startup market, you guys are going to go bankrupt. And I'm like, your customers don't want to work with us. Yeah. And <laughs> and you won't service people like us. So we love to service our own. And then the second thing was all the content at the time for startups that were at events, they were all high level CEO platitudes, like 50, 60, $100 million CEOs coming and sharing inspirational stories. Those are not valuable to me. I've already quit my job and I want to start a company. I don't care about inspiration. I care about tactics. How do I get my first customers? How do I build my first product? How do I launch? How do I go to market? So we have found two white spaces and we made a bet that actually played off because we had nothing, right? Like, so, so necessity is the mother of all inventions. You do something and it sticks. And these are the two things that stuck. One, I reached out to the local newspaper and I asked them, can you give me a column to cover startups? And this is like, it was a local newspaper that's an arm of the national newspaper, the Canadian uh, Post Media Network. And they said, oh, we're not interested. Like, it's not something we cover. So I went then relentlessly went to a friend who ran a regional blog and I asked him to give me a column. And he said, yeah, you can submit blog posts anytime. I covered two or three startups because I couldn't talk about, I didn't have startup knowledge myself. I had no, no success. So I started covering other startups and then I shared it with those startup founders. They made it go viral on Twitter. Twitter was huge at the time. LinkedIn wasn't prevalent for content distribution like it is today. This is 2012. And then I used that blog and I reached back to the editor and said, hey, you're missing out on a young author audience and the newspaper is going to lose out on this audience completely. I can bring you this audience. Look at this blog post. So now he said, fine, I'll give you one blog post. Another learning here <laughs> or framework or whatever you want to call it. Unless you're doing something illegal as a startup founder, <laughs> your, you, your biggest currency is speed of execution, right? It's like, right. it's key. And so don't ask for permission, beg for forgiveness is, is my philosophy, unless you're doing something illegal. Now he gave me one blog post. So I'm like, what do I call it? I can't talk about startups that people will tune in, but what do I create that he gives me the column perpetually? I, a founder had just raised $3 million. He wasn't getting coverage. So I decided to call the column startup of the week. This is when like even podcasting wasn't popular. Now that did four things for us. Number one, instant social proof. You, you're like, you know, and this, you're basically an editor or writer for a newspaper, right? Yeah. Instant social proof. And when I covered that founder, he got so excited. He saw this as some award ceremony, weekly award ceremony from the newspaper that's going to cover startups every week. And I was seen as the messiah. They shared it that it so much, so widely that it blew up even more than that regional post. Now the editor's calling me. I have missed calls. I'm like, shit, he's going to be pissed. So I, I picked up the phone finally. And he's like, Lloyd, if you commit to writing this every week, I will give you a print column. Ooh. And, and, and that is huge. Even in 2023, there's so many blogs. Print is huge. So that print column now gave us double the credibility. All of a sudden, this founder, co-founder of Boast is a, columnist in the local print newspaper every week at six or 7 a.m the founders are flocking to the newspaper stand to buy this and share it with their friends take photos we got a backlink from the highest domain authority website in the country to a new website that boosted our seo and this backlink was every week for the r d <laughs> to anchor texted keyword and the fourth thing we put a link in there saying if you want to be featured apply so our mm -hmm database started growing. That's what you want, right? From people who want to feature that that's squarely our ideal customer yeah, profile. This sounds like it's really the, the beginning of building this community, right? Because you're looking at these startup founders and now you're building a community of them and then sharing what they're doing and then, you know, having them be excited. I, I love it. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. So, um, 
that was the early thing of, I would say, building an audience, right? The thing is, if people just listen to you, meaning they're reading your blog or they're reading about you in the newspaper or reading any content you post on Insta or TikTok or LinkedIn, it's an audience. It's not a community. It's one way. You talk, they listen for the most. They can right. comment. Yeah. Once you bring that audience together to interact with one another, that's where it actually becomes a community. So now we had this list of people. We knew the other white space was nobody nobody was sharing tactical content at events. They were sharing high-level platitudes. Mm -hmm. So we had a free co-working space, uh, meetup space, and we started inviting these people who started applying, saying, hey, you know, Alice is speaking about how to get your first 10 customers or how to create your first sales playbook. Come on over. There's going to be free pizza. The first meetup, 10 people showed up, right? Yeah. And the key thing now, right, I, I realized looking back, for everyone, four skills are crucial. One is your companions or the community you create. Two is communication. Three is your ability to create, right? Whether it's content, whether it's products, but creation is key. And the fourth C, without it, your community, your creation, and your um, communication all fails. It's consistency. Yeah. If you're not consistent, you will go downhill. And so we never stopped. We, I wrote the startup of the week column for almost three years for free. We hosted these meetups almost every week. We just didn't stop. And Alice, one day, 200 people show up to the co-working space. We had to hijack all the aisles. And the guys who ran the co-working space are like, listen, you can't hack a conference in a co-working space for free. We, we went to the local shop. I think it was the AV shop. And we brought this projector for 50 bucks that we could rent and speakers. And we put it in the middle of all the aisles where people sit. And like, you've disrupted the whole co-working space. I know it's after hours, but still, you can't do this. And that evolved eventually into becoming traction. Um, and the traction conference, which we've hosted now in Vancouver and Calgary and San Francisco, we've had speakers from like the, the C-suite from Twilio and Atlassian and Uber and over 100,000 email subscribers today. But that was the starting point of this community. Now, this community, the key thing, the key learning there is it was all our ideal customer profile. It's things that you preach about, right? Like understanding your ideal customer profile and their pains and the problems and the goals they have. But not only that, because go goals and problems are short-lived. What about their long-term aspirations and what stands in the way? Because your problems and goals maybe bring you your product one, but their aspirations will bring you your next product and next product. See, we went from automating R&D funding from the government to then lending so they get it faster to now R&D analytics so they can innovate faster, all tied to their aspiration. And... We call this community traction because we had no product and no customer. So if you're in the early days, there's one of three kinds of communities you can build. A community of practice is bringing people together to learn about a specific skill or a craft. Right. A community of product is bringing people together to become evangelists around your product, to build on your product, to learn about your product, like the Microsoft community. And the community of play is just bring people together to have fun, like the Nike Running Club or the Harley Davidson community. Now, we had no product or no customers. If we build a community of product, people would think it's a timeshare presentation. So we said, what's the best way to do this? Let's spread knowledge because founders, your ideal customer profile, why do they want government money to invest in their company? Why do they want to invest in their company to grow their company? And so the best word for growth is traction. It never ends. And so we called it traction. Great. I love it. So here you are building this community, sharing great content and doing some consulting, right? I mean, you had to make a living. So you were doing some consulting to help these companies actually get the money, correct? Yes, exactly. And so what happened was over time, it became really easy, right? So think about it. You got visibility when you're starting out and nobody knows you everything follows this pattern visibility credibility and then profitability you got to be seen and if you're seen with people of higher influence than you you get their brand rub you build credibility and then it becomes a natural conversation people are coming to your events they're seeing alice hyman or they're seeing like the ceo of twilio or they're seeing these big name peak speakers come to our event and provide value to them and so they're like hey if you found this valuable um, are you spending money on R&D? Have you thought about 
leveraging government funding for it? How are you doing it? And then naturally people would say, yeah, why should I give my fee to like a big four accounting firm? You're adding so much free value to me. I may as well work with you. And so yeah. that community initially were hosting our own events, going to other people events, and then writing on this newspaper blog helped us grow it. And then we started seeding it because there's only so many people who reply to be featured. And so yeah. because we knew our ICP so well, we would just find those people, get their email addresses and email them. Alice, I kid you not, you know, the number of people who put things out there and then don't want to reach out to people. It's ridiculous. I am everything I am because of cold email. All our speakers, 90% of our speakers, and we've had like CEOs of multi, multi-billion dollar companies like the HubSpots, like the Atlassians, like the Twilios, like the Zendas, like the Marketos, you name it, that I've cold emailed to come speak at our events. Yeah. And so we started just cold emailing people to come to our events to attend as well. And if you're emailing your ICP, right, and you know the circle of influence, meaning they they have certain followers, if your ICP, right, people that they follow the content of, that is your list of people you invite as guests to speak at your events. Right. Then they have people that they fund, meaning other tools, services they pay for. That's your list of people to co-host with or sponsor. And then they have a list of things that they either read like TechCrunch or VentureBeat or uh, platforms where they hang out. That's where you distribute it. Or like if they read TechCrunch or VentureBeat, we started inviting these journalists to come and run interviews on stage and they loved it because they get to interview the big name CEO. So now when you email your ICP saying, hey, founder, come to this event, you're going to have the CEO of Twilio speak about how they went from zero to 10 billion. And you're going to have TechCrunch there. And you're going to have these three service providers who they know. It's like, oh, I'm coming to my tribe, right? And it's it, they don't see it as a sales invitation, but rather exactly. an invitation to a party. Yeah, I, I think that's amazing. And I think all the CEOs out there that are listening and all those who support the CEOs, uh, think about this. If you are not using some sort of, you know, event or community to take your audience to be coming more engaged and interactive, you really need to think about doing it. I believe that most companies today are still trying to do sales the hard way. Yes, you did reach out cold and it was very effective because you had such a narrow niche. You knew exactly who you were going after and you had the right message for them. Uh, too many companies don't niche in enough and they don't have the right message, as we know, unfortunately. But if even doesn't really matter what you sell, if you have an audience, people who follow you, people who buy from you, and you want to get them more engaged, think about building these communities or doing some sort of an event because it truly is a marvelous way to pull people together and have them really become so loyal to your brand, right? So uh, Lloyd, you've got this all going and now you're still doing consulting. Now there was a switch in there somewhere where you went from consulting to having the software. And also there was a place where you couldn't do all of the communication to people who wanted to buy anymore. And you started to hire uh, some salespeople. So tell us about that. Definitely. So, you know, startups are built in phases, I feel. And a lot of the times what happens as founders is we try to boil the ocean and do too many things at once and we become our own enemies, right? So let's walk through the phases for, and, and I didn't have these answers. When you have a success, you feel like, oh, you know what? Everything is a framework. When we were in there, we we're like, God, like just let something stick, right? And so the phases for us is, first phase is validation. You have an idea. You don't know if the market even needs this. What are you going to do? Get 10 people, especially in B2B, that get 10 people who are not your relatives to pay you to try it out. So then what is the what is the leading indicator of that is conversations. Can I reach out to 100, 200 people? Like, is the market big enough where I can talk to 100, 200 people? Right. That's the leading indicator. What's another leading indicator? Is my message resonating? Meaning, is there message market fit? They have a problem. I have a solution. It resonates. And 10 people will pay me to try it out pilot. Nothing else matters here. I am the founder. I am the pirate. It's founder-led sales. I don't care who you are. 
for 99% of the companies, and you can give me examples of anomalies that succeeded, but for 99% of the B2B companies, one of the founders, especially the ones that are bootstrapped, one of the founders has to go out there and sell. If you can't convince your first 10 customers, 20 customers to buy you, there's no magic VP of sales that's going to come in to a startup that doesn't have product market fit and build your playbook. Like, you know, it's very rare, right? I mean, how often have you seen that? Like, there's no product market fit. There's Never, no, product. no. I mean, this is where the big fail is, actually. And I'm sure you've seen this because you've worked for plenty of startups. But with all of the startups that I have mentored or worked with, they want to hire a seller too early in. They want to hire a leader of sales too early in when they haven't proven out that it can work, right? So founder-led sales is the best way to start. And even if you're a little tentative about doing it, it truly works because you have that entrepreneurial enthusiasm that can break through. You have the title that can break through and you have no process and you have no product market fit, or maybe you do, but it's, uh, it's hard in the beginning unless you have this entrepreneurial enthusiasm and this gravitas with your title that gives you entree, right? And so it really is the best way. And then once you have referenceable customers and you have a bit of a process to get them and keep them, then you can start to bring in other people to do what you do. So I know you did that. Tell us about that. Yeah, so definitely. So we got like the first several customers through this community process, which was literally pirates, elbows out, poking fingers, hosting a lot of events at like, you know, although we couldn't scale, but hosting a lot of events ourselves, writing these posts, swarming other people's events. And I, I kid you not, Alice, we're sound in sight right now. I truly believe in in-person and in-person doesn't have to be a big traction like production with thousand people. It can be 10% meetups because the compound interest in doing a 10% meetup every week will land you one customer or build your pipeline versus waiting six months, eight months to sell Could that one conference. Could not agree more. Could not agree more. Such a simple thing that so many overlook. Again, making sales so hard. The, the right 10 people in the room, it's magic. It is, exactly. And the compound interest on that, and I'll, I'll tell you how that changed for us during COVID, but when we changed it to a new format, is huge, right? Like Because now every week you're inviting people with a new message. Come learn about your first 10 customers from Alice or come next week and learn about how to launch your product from Lloyd, right? Versus saying, buy this conference, buy this conference for six months. And then you hope you meet a thousand people meeting 10 people every week is bigger. It's, it's huger. And the compound interest on that is like just building your pipeline month over month, quarter over quarter. So we just did that. It worked well. We started uh, polishing our messaging. We had an early sales process going that, you know, step one is you got to qualify and then you quantify it with numbers and then you close. We had like a 3Q sales process that worked really well. And, and then we could hire our first salesperson. And I still remember Alex and I were like throughout applications. We couldn't afford to pay anyone anything. And we started getting all these job applications by the droves and nobody would take this job. And uh, we get this Olympian, Jeff Christie, who applied. And he's our chief uh, business officer right now. He's stuck with us all these years. Um, a big shareholder also in the company. And he eventually ended up taking it. And I think I remember him interviewing from the Olympics. He was a winter Olympics uh, luge, luge Olympian. And uh, he, he was interviewing from Europe. And, you know, Alex is like, listen, he will take the job for low pay because, and that's, that's what we can afford. But here's the thing. To be an Olympian, you need to have a lot of grit and determination, and you need to have the ability to stick with something. And by being an Olympian, at least he shows that he's coachable. He has the grit, and he'll stick with something, and that's what we need. All these other people have jumped jobs to jobs to jobs, right? And this person, although has no sales experience, but at least he's stuck with something for so many years. And that's what Alex said, and that stuck with me. And I realized, you know, as you scale a company, never hire for experience, Hire for trajectory. I have this saying now that goes, if you keep people promoting people and keep hiring people on tenure versus trajectory, you'll eventually become the very thing you set out to disrupt. And so Jeff, the bet played out really well. We had a basic playbook, like what messaging resonates at qualification stage. 
what uh, messaging resonates at the quantification stage where you discuss numbers and everything and how to sort of navigate the proposal phases. And so we had that basically written down. We had a crappy, not crappy, but like a basic CRM setup. It wasn't Salesforce. Um, like it was a cheap $20 a month solution. And so then Jeff came on and he took that forward and was able to probably last it another one year or something himself, selling himself plus me. And then we started hiring a couple other people. And so Jeff became this really good person who could take this playbook, basic playbook we had and explode it. But then every time we went to a new market, like a Toronto or a San Francisco, like a US market, or we had a new product, I end up being that salesperson number one, figure it out, figure the playbook. That was very exciting to me. You know, as a founder, you need to reinvent your job in the job or else, you know, you, you, you sort of get, what do you call it? Like mundane kind of thing. You feel like complacent. And what I found is that I'm driven by this excitement of trying and doing new things. And so when we had this predominantly community model with an in-person selling model, meaning our salespeople would go to events like sort of extended community managers. We call them business development. That's why I'm not sales. They didn't have like sales in their title. They would go out, go to events, socialize, socialize with partners, like basically the circle of influence around our ICP, which is people who they follow, people who they buy from, build partnerships, co-host events with them, meet with them, hang out with them, mine for referrals, mine for direct customers, just a lot of events. And then um, we introduced, I think, uh, the, the cold calling, cold emailing method, signed up with Apollo. I became the first SDR. And what was funny was we were targeting a completely new market in the US. And I just attached uh, my email inbox to an outbounding system. And in, in like eight months, I signed the equivalent of one sales rep just by cold emailing with very smart sequence messaging. Because before you disrupt the team and say, adopt this, somebody has to validate it. Like I was going back to saying like startups are building phases. Phase one is validation. Do you have a message market fit? That is the goal. Phase two is product market fit. Do customers leave you? Meaning your message resonated, but now every time they have that problem, do they keep coming back to you? Phase three is product channel fit. Meaning do you have one repeatable, scalable channel to acquire customers? For us, it was a combination of community and, and predominantly community because the salespeople served as community people going out there and talking to others. And then the last phase is scale. Now, what people do at scale is they tr throw everything in the kitchen scene. They're like, okay, let's go to Europe and also launch this new product and five other channels. And that's silly because that's where you fail. At scale, just throw fuel on the fire. If community work for you or sales work for you, do that 75% of the time. Then 25% of the time, try new things. And my job was then at scale doing that, figure out SDR. It was so much fun. Imagine I'm, I'm sending SDR emails in a sequence and testing open rates, messaging, improving it. And I'm getting meetings. I'm also taking those meetings myself and closing it. So in like seven, eight months, I had a playbook now that I could hand over to Jeff. And then Jeff hired two SDRs. And now SDRs become like a secondary huge channel for us. The same thing I started to do for partnerships. I signed our big partnership client that now does $3 million in revenue with us. We had a bit of a uh, partnerships playbook going. We already knew that who was our circle of influence buying from, so we could activate them. Then hand it over, hire a head of partnerships, and she's crushing it. So that's the thing, right? I think it's important for one person at least in the founding team to reinvent their job in the job to help scale the company. And, uh, and I think... You need two people at scale in a company. One is this pirate founder mindset whose job is to inject new risk in the business because pain is the precondition for growth. You grow by injecting new risk, trying new things. But then you also need somebody with a CEO kind of mindset whose job is to stabilize the company. Is there money in the bank? Are the lights on? Are the customers not churning? Those kinds of things. So Alex and I worked really well, well in that scape where it was me injecting new risk in the business and evangelizing new things and evangelizing the company. And he was making sure that the, the existing product doesn't go to crap while I'm trying to uh, do all this other new risky stuff. Right. Oh my goodness. So uh, that is exciting. And I always say that the CEO or founders, you know, co-founders, always have a role in sales, but that role changes as the company matures. And I love that you were willing to 
go out on a limb, take the risk and be the one to try doing the new thing in sales first to build that playbook. And that allowed you far greater success than if you would have hired someone in to try to do it because you live and breathe the brand, you know what works from the beginning and you have that drive and that attitude, right? To make it work right. So it's easy to hand off to somebody else. So I, I really applaud you for that because many people just, just don't want to do it. Right. Uh, you love the change and the challenge and, uh, it, it really worked for you. So you guys grew the company up. You've got a now, um, an actual product instead of consulting that helps people get these, um, this R and D money and tracks it and, and helps them do all the things that they need to do on top of the fact that you've added the lending to it, which is just amazing. Um, gosh, it, the time flew by so fast. Um, but in wrapping up, I do want to talk about what you did with all of this tremendous experience you have and put it into a book, which for you was a huge laborious task because as you mentioned earlier, um, you're not that great at reading and writing. It's just not something that was your strength in school. And I don't know, you probably don't know this about me, but before I went into sales and into business, I was a special education teacher. So I worked with a lot of kids who had difficulty reading or learning. And i um, proud to say that I know many of them have gone on to be company founders and things like that. Um, you did not let that hold you back. Um, at all in any way whatsoever. I mean, you got a degree in engineering, you know, you've been in the startup world now, a very successful co-founder and an author. So tell us a little bit about what you packed into the book and how people can get it. Definitely. So, you know, um, this book is a labor of love for me. And I, I'll tell you why I wrote it all my life. I had no money. Okay. And, and coming from very humble backgrounds, my parents grew up in the slums of India and, uh, I, I was born in Kuwait, refugee of the Gulf War, ended up in Canada through that. And so all my life, I had no money and I was happy. The one thing was consistent, spending time, spending my childhood summers in the slums of Mumbai, which was community. And I would grab my parents' feet every time they had to go back to Kuwait at the end of the summer. Gulf War was community. When I went into sales, I joined like a number of sales communities, including HubSpot's inbound community, and then built Boast through this community. That was my vibe, my life. And then a couple of years ago, um, end of the pen, near the end of 2020, uh, to, uh, near the end of 2020, we sold majority stake in Boast, about 52% to a growth equity firm. And I transitioned out of the day to day in the year or so that uh, after, and and moved to the board. And you know, I went from being piss poor to having millions, but somehow I ended up depressed. Somehow I hit an all-time low. I face planted rock bottom, got out of shape. My life changed and I couldn't figure out why. And then what brought me to good health and sanity was again, the people, the community. And I realized that, you know, it's neither the destination nor the journey, but your companions that matter the most. It's a kid who was swimming in the puddles of Mumbai in the slums, didn't want to leave. But the same guy who now is hanging out with people sipping rich, rich people in the chateaus in Paris doesn't want to be there. And I'm like, loneliness is the number one killer in America. And you know, there's this concept of blue zones, five places around the world where people live functionally till 100, four or five out of their nine traits have to do with community. And so I, I realized like all the money in the world doesn't matter if you don't have your people. And then I started reflecting on my journey and it was all community. And that's that's why I got depressed is when I left the day to day, I felt I lost my tribe, which wasn't the case, luckily. And then I started to look at different brands that had endured, not the tech companies in the last 20 years, but like enduring brands like the Harley Davidsons and the Nikes. And I talked to so many community members, the count ended up being like a thousand or more. And I found something very interesting. Every obscure idea that eventually became an enduring global phenomena from Christ to CrossFit had these exact four same stages. From Christ to CrossFit, every obscure idea that became a global phenomena went through these four stages. People listen to you, you have an audience or buy your product, you have an audience. When they come together, when you bring them together to interact with one another, it becomes a community. But when that community comes together to create impact, 
for a purpose that's far greater than your product or your profit, it becomes a movement. And when that movement has undying faith in its purpose through sustained rituals over time, it becomes a cult or a religion. And that was very impactful for me because I'm like, I stopped my journey at community, but look at what Harley Davidson has done or look at what Nike has done or look at what CrossFit has done. And so I'm like, you know what? I'm sitting on all this free time. I'm in the best health and freedom of my life. It would be a disservice if I didn't write a book about this to educate people on how to create communities that turn into movements and cults of their own. And honestly, you know, if you go back to the first few things I said, if you don't love your customer, you'll not sustainably create for it. I never stopped creating for this customer, whether it's Boast. We did a couple other startups targeting at this, uh, targeting the same ideal customer profile, which is entrepreneurs and founders. We built a large community and a conference called Traction. And now I wrote a book because this is my tribe and I want to just continue adding value to it. That's why I wrote it. And it's here from grassroots to greatness, 13 rules to build iconic brands with community led growth. Great. And it's on Amazon, so you can get it there. And tell us how to find Boast in case they do need that R&D money. Definitely. It's Boast.ai. Very easy. Simple. Simple Very as that. Easy. Well, I it's been a pleasure. Your story is one of amazing fortitude, grit, greatness. And I appreciate you sharing it with everybody and sharing the actionable things that you did that others can consider doing as well. So thank you so much for being on the show. Definitely. Thank you so much. My fanboy moment from like, I don't know, 20 years, yeah, 2005. So almost 20 years has come to life. I'm truly, truly humbled and honored. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's just been a pleasure. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and we'll see you next week.